All right, I think it's about time to get started. Uh, let me welcome you all to uh, the second day of the spring 20, I'm sorry, of the fall 2020 uh, CNI virtual member meeting. Uh, I'm delighted you joined us today. I'm Cliff Lynch. I'm the uh, director of CNI and I will be introducing this session very briefly. Um, after we hear from our speaker, uh, Diane Goldenberg Hart from CNI will beam in and um, uh, moderate the uh, question and answer session at the end. You have a both a chat tool, which you should use to feel free to uh, comment on the discussion as we go along, and also a Q&A tool, which I invite you to use to pose questions at any point. Um, although we will get to all the questions at the end of the session. I just also note that we do have closed captioning available, which you are welcome to uh, turn on if you wish. And for those of you who didn't hear the um, conversation between Bill and I at the beginning of the session, um, the session is being recorded and the recording will be available after through our usual channels. Uh, and I think that's all my announcements. So let me move on and uh, take us right to uh, Bill Ingram um, from, the, uh, from Virginia Tech. Uh, Bill is going to talk to us today about mining um, uh, electronic theses and dis dissertations for identifying and understanding trends in graduate research. Um, I'm familiar with a fair body of work that tries to mine uh, scholarly published literature, um, journal literature, to identify emerging trends. But um, the, the ETD um, uh, corpus is really quite a special corpus with some unique properties and I think offers some unique uh, insights into things. So I'm going to be very interested to hear what uh, Bill has to tell us about this. And with that, um, thank you for joining us today, Bill, and over to you. Great, thank you. I hope everybody can hear me um, and thank you for the, the warm welcome. So uh, I'll just jump right in. Um, I uh, am uh, a librarian at, at Virginia Tech and, uh, and a researcher. And uh, my researcher uh, explores the application of, of computational methods and techniques on on uh, library collections. So the, uh, the idea of uh, uh, collections as data and using uh, computational methods to, to mine. Um, I'm interested in, in machine learning, uh, natural language processing and, um, and, and the like. Uh, and what you're looking at here is a, a, just a summary slide of, of uh, the grant that I uh, am working under. This is from uh, IMLS. Uh, it's uh, funded um, me for, for three years to uh, explore um, all of these uh, techniques against the corpus of, of ETDs. Uh, so we're, we're particularly interested in ETDs because they are uh, longer documents, they, they resemble books, um, and uh, we're, we're focusing on three areas, uh, information extraction, uh, classification and summarization using machine learning and deep learning, and uh, ultimately better uh, building better digital libraries uh, by adding value uh, through these services. Uh, sorry, I'm losing my timer. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, this is the team that I'm working with. So uh, we, uh, my uh, co-PIs are, are Ed Fox and, and Jen Wu uh, from um, computer science uh, at Virginia Tech and, and Old Dominion. And then uh, there are two graduate students that work uh, with us uh, full-time. Uh, Bipasha uh, works for me and, and Montabir works uh, for uh, Dr. Wu at, at Old Dominion. Um, and I also wanted to just list a, a few names uh, of students, uh, past and present, that have been working in our lab. Um, uh, two of them uh, just finished uh, with master's degrees uh, in uh, dissertation, or sorry, theses on uh, on ETDs um, and the rest of the folks listed down there are also working on uh, ETD related uh, research. So uh, those of you who were um, at CNI uh, last year might remember that I gave a talk uh, about this project, about bringing computational access to book length documents. 
Um, after the talk, uh, I was approached by uh, the chief strategy officer at ProQuest. And um, I had mentioned in the talk that we were interested in the ProQuest subject categories for uh, doing automatic classification. And uh, so we had a nice uh, conversation and that led to uh, me meeting uh, the, the team that uh, is uh, responsible for the new TDM studio. So text and data mining studio at, at uh, ProQuest. And um, so that led to conversations with, uh, among others, that the two uh, folks that I've got on this slide, John Dillon and, and Austin McLean. Um, I'd actually known Austin before, uh, but this opened up a, uh, a collaboration which led to a pilot uh, of their new uh, software. So um, this talk is, is about that pilot. It's about the data that we were using. It's about the, um, the, the study that we did. Um, so I'll try to uh, uh, address all of these things. So um, I, I wanna give a, a quick overview of the TDM Studio. Uh, I'll introduce the research question that we're trying to, to answer talk about the data, the methodology, and then share some results and uh, hopefully have some time uh, at the end for discussion. Uh, before we do that though, I, I just wanna um, have a disclaimer here that uh, this isn't a, a product endorsement for, uh, for the studio. Um, these are just my opinions. This is my research and they don't reflect uh, uh, the, the, uh, the views of, of ProQuest or of, of IMLS or, or of Virginia Tech Libraries or, or anyone else. Um, that said, we did uh, have um, an enjoyable and, and, and very positive experience uh, working with, with ProQuest and uh, with the, the TDM Studio. Um, this is a, a sort of a high level overview of, of what the studio is. So um, there's a, an interface where you select content, um, and for us, this was obviously ETDs, but they have uh, any content um, that I believe that your library is uh, uh, subscribes to uh, is available, um, including a lot of newspapers, which uh, I thought was very interesting that lead right up until, I think you could even bring in yesterday's news, uh, perhaps even today's news uh, into uh, what they're calling uh, the uh, workbench where um, it is a, a Jupyter interface for uh, interacting with the data either with, with Python or with R, um, and then exporting your results um, and, and graphing them, et cetera. And so I'll, I'll be showing you actually lots of graphs um, here at the end. <clears throat> um, I, I, I should mention uh, that, you know, although I'm not an expert on this on the studio, I'll, I'll try to uh, field any questions, but um, there's a slide out that I'll put at the end um, if you want to get in touch with the ProQuest folks because they're they're the experts on this, obviously. Uh, in the beginning, um, you log in, and once you have a, um, a, an account, uh, you are given this, this uh, web interface for selecting the data that you want to bring into your studio. Um, so this should be you know, fairly familiar for anyone who's worked with digital libraries. Um, you select uh, the, the either publication titles or a particular database that you want to bring in in, uh, information into your into your instance. Uh, I think <clears throat> what's interesting here is that the content rights have all been cleared for TDM. So um, I think that's actually kind of a big deal that uh, you can bring in, like I said, newspaper articles, the New York Times. Um, in, it's not so much of, a, of an um, issue with ETD since most of them are openly licensed, but um, for the content that other folks might be interested in, um, it's all cleared uh, for, for doing text and data mining. And you can build data sets up to, to um, 2 million documents, uh, which we almost did. So, uh, you know, it's sort of a faceted search and browse. We, we chose the, the ProQuest uh, uh, dissertations and theses global collection, uh, drilled down into that. Um, as you see there, the, the 2 million uh, document limit um, so we had to winnow this down a bit uh, in order to um, meet that limit, but um, we finally did. And, and so once you, you have your collection set up, you, you set off the, the uh, movement of the files. And so this, this takes a, a fair amount of time um, for the files to move over. But once you uh, have them moved over, then, then you can interact with the data using a standard Jupyter notebook, um, which uh, 
folks that are, are doing data science are uh, really familiar with. Um, so uh, this is just a, a screenshot of, of kind of what that looks like. <clears throat> so the question that we wanted to do, um, and I should say that this pilot was, was three months. Um, and so um, we didn't have a lot of time, and, but we wanted to do a study. We wanted to see you know, what we could do with the data. Um, this is uh, a bit different than my normal research uh, in that uh, it's, it's more of a text mining, um, less of a machine learning. Uh, classification uh, type of uh, task that we we set for ourselves, um, but I still think it's it's really interesting. Um, so what what do we want to do? We we want to see what we can learn um, through text mining of the ETD corpus uh, about how graduate uh, research topics have evolved over time, and especially interesting is the interdisciplinarity uh, between uh, or among uh, different uh, majors or departments. Um, in graduate research. Uh, this is particularly uh, interesting for me um, because it, early in my career in libraries, um, I was working on putting together uh, the, the, the systems uh, to collect and, and, um, and display ETDs. And so now we've been you know, gathering ETDs for almost 20 years and we have this, this great corpus. Um, and, and it, uh, it is really a reflection of, um, of research that's, that's happening uh, across the country, uh, across the world. Um, and uh, there, and it, it's, it's just really exciting to be on the other side uh, to, to mine it and making use of it, um, especially in, in this way. So uh, we were able to move over roughly 1.3 million uh, ETDs. Uh, now this is from the year 2000 to 2018. Uh, we were talking earlier, uh, and I can't remember why we stopped at 2018, but I think it was, uh, it, it could have been that that's, that's the, the limit for when um, that was mostly the, the time that it was had full collections available. Um, but we started around 2000 because we wanted to get born digital. Uh, I didn't want to have the added um, uh, complication of, of having to use OCR text. Um, so, uh, but still, this is a lot of, of uh, dissertations. Um, what you would get in the, the studio is, is full text, um, XML, and metadata. Um, we wanted uh, to get uh, department metadata that was important for the, for the study. So we ended up having to winnow this down even further down to uh, just 600,000 documents so that we would have the, the department metadata. Um, and so this is the top 20 uh, departments that we, that we harvested and, 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 and are working with, uh, minus the, the one there in the middle department not provided. <clears throat> so with this uh, data set, we extracted uh, title, abstract, department, um, and the year of publication. Uh, we organized this into batches uh, by years and by major. And uh, the intuition behind this is that the top terms uh, would be present in, in the uh, title and abstract, uh, which would indicate the research topic of the paper. And so um, a bit more on that here in a moment. Uh, the, the sources of data, um, there ended up being, uh, I think, over a thousand. Um, but this is the top 20 institutions. So this was completely random. Um, we, we didn't really look at, at what the, uh, the sources were. Um, we were more concerned with, with getting the numbers. Um, but this is just how the spread uh, looks. And then a little bit more uh, detail here. Um, as you can see in the top graph uh, up there, the green one, um, there's a, a really, a, there's a long tail of, of universities that the data came from. Uh, but the majority uh, are from these top 20 here um, that are shown uh, here in, in uh, pink. <clears throat> so uh, the methodology that we use, uh, again, what we're concerned with is trying to find out, uh, you know, what is the topic? What is the research topic of this paper? And um, so to do that, uh, our, our first attempt was to use uh, the TFIDF, which is the, the term frequency, inverse document frequency, a measure to try to collect the, the most important two or, or three word phrases um, across the corpus, so uh, within a major. 
Um, and initially this looked very promising. Uh, and so you can see from the, the first two columns, this is computer science. I don't know if you're seeing my mouse moving, but this is computer science here, user interfaces, digital libraries, et cetera. That seems good. Uh, these look like research topics in computer science. Um, over here in, in biology, these also uh, seem to uh, be working well. Uh, however, the problem was we we're also turning up a lot of other uh, mainly irrelevant phrases such as results show and future work, uh, high level, these kind of things that just made uh, way too much noise and um, so that that wasn't working. Uh, what we ended up doing is using uh, this tool called Wikifire uh, that was developed by uh, Dan Roth's uh, lab um, when he was at uh, Illinois. Uh, he's since moved to UPenn, um, but what it does is uh, takes a, a stream of text and um, it, it's, it's mainly for uh, author disambiguation or, or named entity uh, disambiguation. And so it, it runs uh, the, the text through a, a, a search into Wikipedia and tries to return um, the entities that are uh, that, that have matching uh, Wikipedia articles. And so here you see there's the, the underlying terms. Those are actually links to the articles in, in Wikipedia. And then the bolded terms, I believe are uh, uh, terms that they had uh, pulled out as being context uh, in order to disambiguate what the entity is. Uh, so this is, this is not our work. This is a, a, just a, a tool that, that we are using. Um, if you're interested in that, I suggest reading the paper that I have here linked below. Um, okay, so, but anyway, so what we did with it was this is use the Wikifire um, to identify what, the, what the, the terms are. And then we were able to use this to, um, to uh, rank them uh, so that we could figure out what the topic of the paper was. Um, so uh, this is kind of a step-by-step -step here of, of what we did. Um, the first was, was to, uh, for every document in the batch, uh, use Wikifire uh, to you know, sort of Wikify that, the, the text uh, that we extracted. And again, this text is just the abstract and title. Um, and, then, and then ranking those terms to define out what the, what the research topics for that department or major were. <clears throat> and then uh, the way we rank those is by calculating the document frequency uh, across different uh, periods of time. So what I mean is how many documents contained that phrase uh, over in a certain batch of time. And uh, we normalized uh, against the number of documents so that it, you know if one document had just that phrase over and over and over again, it wouldn't unfairly uh, weigh, weigh the results. Uh, and then plot the results uh, on a graph uh, so that we can see what the, <clears throat> what the highest document frequency uh, terms uh, ended up being for the department and, uh, and then compare these with other departments. Uh, and, then, um, and then finally plotting multiple departments so that we could see what the, the shared uh, topics that they have across them. So um, the I made a lot of these, and uh, what I am going to focus on is, is the intersection of computer science and biology, um, which I, I just think is interesting um, myself, and, and I know the most about computer science out of any of these. Um, not so much about biology, but um, let's explore the data. So I'm going to show a series of these, these sort of bubble graphs, and I, I made these with, uh, with Giphy. Um, on the data. So this is uh, computer science from, uh, let's see, uh, 2001 to 2005. Uh, and these are the major topics here it, for, <clears throat> for various reasons. And uh, we could talk about that if, if we have time, but the, 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 there's a, some sparsity here in these early years. Uh, it doesn't really get interesting um, until, let's see until here. So now you can really start to see these, these research topics emerging, um, you know, and, and so the, the size of, of each circle represents the, the, the ranking, the, you know, the weight of, of, of the topic. And so you can see here now that we're, we're you know, nearing the, the end of the, the first uh, decade of, of the year 2000, 
um, these are the, the the topics that are emerging in computer science. And so it, it's interesting. Um, machine learning, of course, very big. Um, there's there's these uh, sensor networks um, and wireless sensor networks. A lot of this sensor network stuff, uh, you don't really see that a lot anymore. So um, that was evidently very hot uh, in this area in, uh, in, in during this time period. See social networks starting to emerge. Social networks um, that that wasn't there really in the data at all pre two thousand six. As we move in into the, the 2010s, uh, you see machine learning continuing to have a, a very strong uh, presence here. Uh, the, the sensor networks are starting to get smaller. Um, data mining starting to get bigger. Social networking still bigger social networks. Uh, I, I will say that I, I, I put this together pretty quickly and, and I didn't notice until it was too late that um, the plural version of a lot of these things is represented. So uh, if you just imagine that these like so social network and social networks, uh, just imagine that they're bigger and, and together. But you can see how, how this is trending uh, nonetheless. Uh, so finally, here is, um, here is the most recent batch. Uh, again, uh, machine learning, but you're starting to see the, the uh, deep learning uh, and neural nets really starting to rise um, as, uh, as well as big data. Oh, and there's something, I, I, yeah, let me get back one. Um, if you notice right here, really small, there's big data right in the middle, not so big. Um, it really didn't take off until, I don't know, 2015, and now suddenly big data is, is and it, I think if we continued this into, um, into 2020, we would see that continue to, to grow. Um, Okay, so that's uh, computer science. Um, I wanted to, to do the same thing with bio. Um, this is particularly, I don't know, sort of funny uh, to me that, that, that again, in, the, in the, these first few years, uh, there isn't as much data, so the, the topics aren't emerging in the same way as they do later, but uh, it seems that the biologists were interested in, in uh, prairie grass uh, for the most part uh, until now you're starting to see um, what I, more of what I expected uh, with, with T cells, with gene expression, um, genetic analysis. A lot of these uh, words that I, I don't even know how to pronounce, I, I assume that these are, are genes that, that they are studying. Uh, this goes into, um, uh, oh, let me get back for a minute. Uh, w w one of the things that, that's really been interesting in doing these is seeing the, how different topics emerge and, and, and are, are sort of growing. So um, on this slide, you don't see anything about climate change, uh, but it really emerges in, in the next, uh, here in this, this batch of four years. And so now climate change is suddenly on the map. You know, people are interested in studying that. And that, that surprised me. I, I thought that that would have been, um, you know, going on in the research for, for much earlier, but it, it turns out it didn't. Um, again, nothing, nothing else. Uh, too surprising in this. Uh, finally, the the last uh, of the of the bio stuff um, that this gene expression, of course, just keeps uh, you know showing up. T cells have just gotten bigger and bigger, um, and uh, stem cells were another one that I saw sort of sort of arise through through the data. Um, I need to hurry up. <clears throat> so here's the, inter, uh, the intersection of CS and biology. Um, it, it, the, the first batch of years really didn't have much results at all, but um, you start to see them here with DNA sequencing, statistical analysis, um, uh, actually not very surprising. Um, huge uh, gene expression, um, again, climate change. And so keep in mind, this is the intersection of CS papers and bio papers. So that means there were CS papers that were written about climate change, about uh, gene expression, about uh, DNA sequences. And then finally, here's the, the most recent uh, batch where, where you see the, um, the, uh, the um, intersection of, of CS and, and bio. 
what surprised me about this, and um, I don't know if, if, if you share this surprise or maybe it was my naivete, I expected to see more of the computer science terms showing up in this intersection. But for the most part, this intersection is all biology terms. And, uh, and, I, and that, that could just be, and I'm reminded uh, that uh, computational biology is a subfield of computer science. It's not a subfield of biology. So that, that alone could just explain it. Um, but I thought that was fascinating that uh, you know, computer science is uh, be becoming a lot of other, other things. Uh, just, just for reference, um, I, I wanted to show the intersection of, of e econ and math um, no real surprises here are that, you know, the big uh, interdisciplinary uh, topic between econ and math is game theory. So um, that, that's what you see here. And then the most recent, <clears throat> again, Monte Carlo, Mar Markov chains, uh, et cetera. Um, but you do see the machine learning here. So, you know, we've, we've got computer science uh, in, in this area as well. So uh, let's see, what have I got? Right, so um, we don't have very much time, but I wanted to open up for questions. Uh, be before I do, I just wanna revisit uh, the, the research question. So, you know, what can we learn through text and data mining um, about uh, the evolution of research topics? And I think that we've shown that it is possible to determine the, the research focus of an ETD uh, using methods from natural language processing, uh, specifically using the Illinois Wikifier um, for concept disambiguation, and then uh, graphing the document frequency of these research topics uh, allows us to visualize uh, the relative importance of these topics uh, within and across uh, disciplines. Uh, so that's it. I wanted to just thank um, ProQuest for allowing us to use the, the studio and to do this. And of course, thank you to, the, um, to IMLS for their continued support. Um, and I have a, a slide here at the very end, if you wanted to get in touch with uh, ProQuest uh, about uh, this uh, product, um, you should try one of these uh, options here. Okay, so if there's questions, um, I'm full screen, so I can't see if there are questions, but. Great, thank you, Bill. Uh, there actually are some questions. That was a really interesting talk, and I know people are curious to know more. Uh, we have a First, a comment from Rebecca Bryant, and then a question. Uh, Rebecca says, this is more of a comment for Bill than a question. I think that the Council of Graduate Schools would be very interested in hearing about your research as you help inform how graduate education has changed in the past two decades. Um, and she goes on to ask, um, a number of institutions have now gone no quest, meaning they're no longer sending their data to ProQuest. Is your research here dependent upon the data set ProQuest maintains, uh, i.e. institutions not sending copies or metadata to ProQuest are not included? In this particular experiment, um, they are not. Um, although from what I know, and again, you know, somebody from ProQuest would, would know more about this, um, because of the copyright clearance, you, you can't pull data out of the out of the studio, obviously, um, but you can bring in your own data. And so if we, you know, we've actually as as part of the, the larger uh, grant funded research have been amassing um, a, a quite a large uh, corpus of, of ETDs for our own research. And this is all by harvesting from open repositories. And <clears throat> so we've got about 500,000 of those. Uh, the opportunity with with ProQuest, though, was to be able to really have, you know, the fire hose of, of ProQuest. You know, it, it would have, I don't know if it would have been possible um, or feasible uh, to collect uh, 1.3 million ETDs by crawling institutional repositories. Uh, so that that was uh, that was the advantage here. Interesting. Uh, that answered the question, but. Yeah, that, that well, that's a really interesting question. Thanks, Rebecca, for bringing that up and. Um, thank you for addressing it, Bill. Uh, next, we have a question from Michael Seidel, who asks, how are you handling multi-language is issues, or is the focus mainly on English language works? And it looked like your corpus there was mostly US-based, Canadian, and British. Yeah, I mean, that, that's why. We, we, we made it easy for ourselves. 
Um, although there is um, a woman uh, in, in my lab who is uh, doing her master's work on uh, Arabic ETDs and, um, and is doing uh, automatic classification of, of them. And so if anybody knows, uh, she's actually, it, it's been a challenge to gather enough uh, Arabic ETDs in order to um, you know, have training data for her models. So if anybody knows a source of Arabic ETDs, uh, please share that with me. But yeah, that's, uh, that's an interesting topic as well. Great, thank you. And thanks, Michael, for the question. Uh, now we have a question from Cliff Lynch. Uh, Cliff says, it looks like the time to produce a thesis is much longer than the time to get papers or conference papers published. So you're going to be recognizing topic emergence more slowly in the ETD database than in literature analysis. How much more slowly? What's the average time between selection of research topic to acceptance of thesis? That's that's interesting. I, I don't know the answer to that, but I mean, I could I could think of a good study to do where you would compare the you know the emergence of topics um, in the you know sort of the journal and conference literature versus the ETD literature. I think that would be that would be interesting. Indeed, and uh, Rebecca is uh, Bryant is uh, piggybacking on Cliff's question. Um, I think it would be really interesting to combine this study with data from the survey of earned doctorates. So lots of fodder to follow on your, your project there. Well, I wanna thank uh, Bill so much for coming to CNI to present the results of his work and in fact, his project with us. It's really interesting and we'll look forward to hearing more about this. Um, I also wanna thank our attendees for joining us. I see that we are a little bit past time so I'm going to uh, go ahead and turn off the recording um, on this session and just invite any attendees who are still around and have time if they'd like to stay back and um, chat with Bill, ask questions, just raise your hand. I'll be happy to unmute you. And uh, we'll have another um, session as part of the fall meeting here at two o'clock, uh, summarizing web archives through storytelling with the Dark and Stormy Archives Project with Sean Jones of Los Alamos National Laboratory. So we hope to see you there at, or at another uh, conference, another session from the conference. Be well, everyone, take care, bye-bye. Thank, thank you for attending. Thank you, Bill. <laughs>